Good evening, everybody. Welcome to episode eight. Tonight's show is all about um, some of my favorite people uh, and some of the greatest love stories that uh, classical music history has to celebrate. So tonight we're, we're going to listen to uh, Robert and Clara Schumann, the most celebrated musical couple in all of uh, Romantic Europe, and their dear friend and how those people came to know each other. So our story begins on October 1st, 1853. And on that day, a 20-year-old Brahms, who had long blonde hair and a very high voice, this is not how we think of Brahms. There are these wonderful portraits of him later in life with his hands behind his back as he walked through the streets in Austria and Vienna. And he has this big belly and this giant beard and, uh, and we imagine a, you know, a really deep voice. Um, the voice never developed for Brahms. Um, there's actually a recording of his voice that exists on an early, um, early recording device and his voice is just remarkably high. Uh, there is some evidence uh, that we have that this was disturbing to him and that he desperately wanted to grow a beard and that maybe when he finally did grow it, that's why it got so long and that he wished his voice were lower. Um, we think of Brahms's music as very um, robust and probably masculine and um, these were actually not physical attributes that he possessed. So interesting to think of the young Brahms uh, with the high voice and the long blonde hair and a really boyish face. Um, I think it's also very cute to note that Brahms, uh, his name was Johannes, and when he was a young little toddler, everyone called him Hannes, which I've always found really endearing. So this young Brahms, who has no career, he's from Hamburg, which is not a very good city for being a musician, not a lot going on there. Uh, and he had the good fortune to have some wonderful piano lessons. His father was a musician and his mother played piano. And he um, had the good fortune to run into a famous violinist who was touring Europe and came through his town. And that was Josef Joachim, the big rock star. And everyone said, there's this wonderful pianist here, Mr. Joachim, Herr Joachim, you must meet this young man. And so. They met and they played together and they became friends and they eventually decided to tour together. Uh, and Joachim encouraged Brahms to approach the musical king and queen of Europe and to take them his music, Robert and Clara, of course, to take them his music and, you know, like, you must meet this young man. This man is so extraordinary. And Brahms, you know, he wasn't really sure. Hamburg and Dusseldorf were far apart and he's just a young man and he has no credentials and he, he didn't really know what to do. And so Josef said, I'll write you a letter. So he wrote him a letter of introduction and off Brahms goes to Dusseldorf to meet the great Robert and Clara Schumann. And this is what happened on October 1, 1853, which is a day I personally celebrate <laughs> in my own calendar uh, because I feel um, so close to these people. And this was a day when music history changed. So he knocked on the door and Robert answered the door and he showed him the letter and miraculously Robert said, please come in. And he took him to the drawing room and Brahms sat down and played this. <laughs> excuse me, I must go get my wife. So he had already heard that gesture that sounds just like Beethoven's Hammerklavier. Ba -dum, ba -bum, ba -ba -bum, bum. And here's Brahms writing the same rhythm, same majestic, heroic, um, youthful theme filled with, you know, all of the idealism of the romantics. And he thought Cla Clara must hear this. So he ran upstairs and he brought her down by the hand and they sat and Brahms played. That was the first movement of his Opus One Sonata, which you will hear right now just as they did. <laughs> <laughs> 
going to fill the shoes of Beethoven. It was this man. Schumann had a music journal, the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik. I'm not sure exactly how often it was published, but he wrote regularly scholarly articles about music and other kinds of art as well, and the state of musical culture and artistic culture in Europe. And not very long after this young man showed up out of the blue, and by the way, never left. <laughs> we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, not long after this, this morning in October, um, Schumann wrote an article proclaiming that he had found music's new messiah. <laughs> Talk about pressure. This is one of the reasons why Brahms could not publish a symphony until he was 45, 40 something, because the weight of this, I mean, what an, you know, what an incredible burden, what an incredible honor, and yet what an incredible burden to be saddled with by this man that you already revere. So complicated relationships. So Brahms, um, after he played the, that was the first movement of Opus One Sonata, um, he played the rest of the sonata, of course, and then he played everything that he had in his, in his portfolio. They must have been there for hours. And uh, it was customary in those days to go visiting in Europe and to stay for three or four weeks or sometimes longer at a time. And so Brahms essentially moved in with them that day. Uh, they had a house full of children and he helped to take care of them. He was very good with the children and he loved them and they would eat meals together. And then after meals, they would take long walks in the countryside and talk about the state of art and music and culture and poetry and you know all these incredible romantic ideals and just kindred spirits. Uh, a three-way friendship with no weak leg. Um, Brahms, of course, was the youngest of the three. So Robert was something like 14 years older than Clara, who was then 13 years older than Brahms. But the, the generations meant nothing to these three. Uh, they would play games where one person, uh, I think they tended to write their music in separate places in the mornings. and. Sometimes somebody would write something and leave it on the piano, kind of like that game where you say the first sentence of a story and then you let your friend take the next sentence. So they would play games like that and there were pieces that all of them contributed to. Uh, and they would also write fugues and counterpoint, a la J.S. Bach, as a way to keep their compositional chops strong and keep their brains active. You know, writing counterpoint and especially fugue is so rigorous for the mind and uh, the, the musical compositional abilities. And so they wrote, they wrote fugues for each other. And Clara, um, Clara was a pianist. Uh, all three of them were pianists and composers. And uh, I decided to bring to you tonight um, a prelude and fugue that Clara Schumann wrote and presumably shared with these two chaps, her husband and her best friend. Uh, so this is a prelude and fugue in F sharp minor by Clara Schumann. 
having to be a pianist. And Robert wanted to be a pianist, but ended up having to be a composer <laughs> because he is the famous person who tried to tie his fourth finger to the ceiling or some contraption he put together to try to strengthen his frustratingly weak fourth finger. We all have one of those, Robert, if only you'd known. He ruined his hand and was just never really able to play again the way he wanted to. So. Uh, Brahms, I think you could say, wanted to do both and did both. So in many ways, he really was the next generation of their union. So you can't really talk about um, Brahms and Clara and Robert without talking about the elephant in the room, which is, were Clara and Brahms in love with each other? It's funny how I call them Robert and Clara by their first names, but for some reason to me, he's always Brahms, never. I never call him Johannes, but I'll try to do that because that's inconsistent and weird. Um, <laughs> so there, um, Robert was afflicted with his, uh, his whole life with a mental illness. We think it might have been bipolar. We think it might have been caused by syphilis that he contracted as a young man in his 20s uh, before he was in love with Clara. But in any case, he suffered dramatic and debilitating mood swings. They make his music amazing, but they made his life a torment. Um, shortly after 1853, when these three came together, I think they had some happy years together, maybe, maybe one and a half happy years together. But then Robert had an episode. He either threw his wedding ring into the Rhine River on a, in a crazy fit or dropped it and then tried to dive in after it to get it out of, you know, grief stricken that he had lost his wedding ring. He and Clara absolutely adored each other. Uh, that is, no, nobody ever has questioned that. They were such a connected couple. And uh, basically the doctors decided that he had tried to kill himself and they whisked him away. Clara was never able to say goodbye. They whisked him away to this place called Endenich, which was an asylum far away over the mountains, and they wouldn't let him see her because they said it would be too upsetting for him or it would, be, it would make him too overwrought. Johannes was allowed to go to Endenich to visit Robert and did, and they would go and they would share compositions, uh, but Robert declined over these years and in 1856 died. Uh, he did get to reunite with his beloved before he died, but it was not very many times. It, it might have only been one time. So a truly tragic end to a very romantic love story. Um, I mentioned in my episode last week that there's a really wonderful historical fictional novel about all of this. And just to recap it for you, it's called Longing. And it's by a, an author named J.D. Landis. And I remember finishing the novel on an airplane to or from somewhere and just dissolved in tears because Robert Schumann had died. <laughs> it's a very absorbing novel, very real. Uh, there is an author named Jan Swafford who's written an incredible biography about Brahms. And he has a hypothesis that Robert hoped Clara and Johannes would marry after he died because he wanted somebody to take care of her. She had all these children. She had this performance career. She now has a house to keep up by herself that he can't help with. And so there is, um, there's a school of thought that Robert blessed this idea and in fact encouraged it. And that after his death, um, 
we do know that Clara and Johannes took an unchaperoned trip together somewhere beautiful lakes mountains you know it's Europe so it's, it's all like that right uh, and Jan Swafford's hypothesis is that Brahms of course they adored each other but that Brahms was unable to write when he was with Clara he was so consumed with you know, passionate feelings for her that it distracted him from his work. And so uh, it never happened. We don't know what happened on that trip, but uh, we do know that they did not become a couple. They did not marry. And he did not assume the mantle of, um, of Robert Schumann. So let's hear from the man himself. Um, this is a piece from his Opus 12, Robert Schumann's Fantasiestücke. And um, this was written during the time when Clara Schumann was living in her father's house in Leipzig. Uh, her father was a famous sought after piano teacher and he was her teacher. And Robert Schumann came from, oh, I forget which city he came from, to study piano with Clara's father. And that is how they met. And Robert moved into the house um, and started taking lessons and taking meals with the family. And Clara at the time was very young, but by the time she was a teenager, they were already head over heels. So um, this piece was written, Friedrich Wieck, the father, was not a fan because he could see that Schumann had some, um, some mental illness issues and he had concerns that Clara wouldn't be able to focus on her own career and that Robert wouldn't be able to provide for her and for a family. So Friedrich opposed the match vehemently and actually Robert and Clara had to go to court to sue for the right to marry, uh, which they did in 1840. This piece was written in 1837 and it was written in a time when they were kept apart and they had to communicate with handkerchiefs out the window and all kinds of you know sense and sensibility type um, uh, shenanigans. So you can imagine that, you know, a young man in the throes of love. I'm gonna play three movements from this piece. Uh, the first is called Des Abends, which means the evening. The second is called Traumas Viren, um, Restless Dreams. And the third, fittingly, will be the end of my program. It is called Ende vom Lied, the end of the song. Thank you. 
Thanks for joining me. That was fun. See you next time.